with that being said, Paige, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And uh, it's all yours. The floor thank is yours. Thank you. All right. Well, Jay, thank you. You did a wonderful introduction. I, I so appreciate that. I think you pretty much covered everything. Um, just a few personal things about me. I was born and raised in Kansas in 1975, and I've been in Arizona since 2007 in the Phoenix metro market. Um, I love Arizona. It's my home here. Um, I've been married for, gosh, 10 years, and I have two children. So I have a son that's 24 and going, working on possibly getting engaged, we're thinking about it, and an 18-year-old daughter that's in, both of them are still in college. So I, I want to thank you for having me today. And Jay, you and I have known each other since probably, gosh, about 2016, I think. And mm -hmm. um, I really enjoy working with Benavia and um, the care partners. And I think you guys have wonderful resources. And I just can't give you enough kudos for everything that you guys do. So for thank you for that. Thank you. So I wanted to um, just kind of start off. I went to, now this is a very interactive presentation. So um, I don't like to be super, super formal. So like I said, I have content. We're going to talk through things. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to raise your hand or, you know, unclick your microphone, like Jay said, and just, just say, hey, I've got a question. Um, I'll stop. We can talk through it and, and go through your question. Um, I went to a, <clears throat> a presentation last week, and this is, this is, this is actually astounding information. So, um, talking about the Alzheimer's and dementia crisis, it says over 6 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. 150,000 Arizonans aged 65 plus live with the disease. 262,000 Arizona family caregivers are affected with 53.5% report chronic health conditions of themselves. We've heard about the caregiver burnout. So, and the projected increase in Arizona cases is 33.5%. 3% by 2025. That is really astounding. Um, it's, you know, and that's why it's so important to, to get the education and find out what you can do for your loved one, or if it's you that's have been recently diagnosed. Um, I don't like to be the bearer of bad news, but we are doing, you know, everything, so much technology and uh, medication and you know, we're trying to find cures. Um, there's a lot of things that are out there to help, but there is no cure. So it is about um, management versus cure at this point. But there are so many resources to make a very fulfilled life for your loved one with dementia. And that's what I want to talk about today. So respect shouldn't be, shouldn't end with a dementia diagnosis. Okay. So you have Turn this down a second. There we go. Can you see? Is this too small, the screen for everybody? I'm going to make sure that's okay. We're good. Okay. That looks good. And people can, just so they know, they can use the slider next to their pictures of everybody to move it back and forth, make it bigger or smaller. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just going to, okay. Wonderful. Let me see here. Okay. So, Respect shouldn't end with a diagnosis of dementia. So do you often hear adults referred to as honey or mama um, or, or derogatory childish names um, that address with respect? Are they, addressed, are they addressed with respect? If you were to close your eyes and listen, would it sound like you're speaking to an adult that have lived a full life? Or would it sound more like you have been transported to a toddler in a room at a daycare center. So I think that first and foremost, it's very important that we are addressing our seniors with dementia. And, and not only, I don't wanna just necessarily say seniors, we have a, I mean, we get in our communities, I, I, had, a, I had an inquiry about two weeks ago of a lady that was 49 years old. Well, I'm 47 years old and she has Lewy body dementia. So I wanna say that it's not just our seniors. These are people, there's of all ages that have different forms of dementia, which is, uh, which is pretty scary. 
Um, so adults have lived for decades and have had many, many experiences. Adults have lived and had many experiences that have shaped their lives and have made them for who they are. They've had certain skills of driving, cooking, choosing what they want to wear, and have done this for years and living on their own. They've taken care of families, functioned independently in school with their families, in their jobs, leisure activities, and in community settings. Most have been responsible to others for their decisions, the impact of those choices on those around them. So these are adults, these are not children. So I think that's very important to remember as we are caring for our loved ones, we have to remember that, okay? So our desire for dignity and value does not disappear with the diagnosis of dementia. Formal language skills can change and not being able to correct someone else does not constitute permission to use language or terms that are demanding or condescending. So that's very important. Again, we wanna make sure that we're not demeaning or providing a condescending behavior towards them. So let's show our folks with dementia in our care, the respect they deserve for the full lives that they have lived by addressing them appropriately, offering them choices in their daily routine and controlling our knee jerk reactions. And I'll talk about this later, um, it's, it's, it's one of those aha moments where we have to start to think about if you are a full-time caregiver and you're caring for someone, a parent, a spouse, uh, you know, a grandparent, whoever you're caring for that that's affecting in your life, you have to make sure we have to look at changing our behavior, not trying to change their behavior. They're doing the best that they can with the abilities that they still have and that they can still control. So here are some suggestions. So offering choices, reasonable choices, they can be simple, they do not have to be difficult. Sometimes less is more. So depending on where your loved one is in their dementia journey is, is where you're going to have to change your behavior, okay? So limiting your choices, but offering reasonable choices, such as this one or that one. Would you like a red marker or a blue marker if they're in an art class? If you're out to lunch, would you like a hamburger or grilled cheese? So offering choices, but not giving them too many choices. In our memory care communities, such as Rock Creek, for those of you that are in the surprise area, we, and, I, and a lot of families, they come in and they tour and they're like, well, why is there not a menu? Well, there's a menu, but we're not going to hand our residents a menu that looks like the Cheesecake Factory <laughs> with 20,000 items to choose from. It's too much. It's overwhelming for them to make a decision. So we have to make, you know, providing them dignity by offering them choices, but just scaling down and making it simple. Okay. Arguing with someone that has dementia will never work. So in, all, in another slide down the road, my dad's famous words to me, and I use this in life, in my personal life, my career, professional life, everyday life, it's always better to be kind than to be right. And I would highly suggest that you use this when you're caring for your loved one. I don't know how many times I've worked with families and they say, well, mom, that's not right. Or don't you remember? They don't remember. Sometimes they may remember depending on their journey, but oftentimes they don't. So removing those words is don't, don't you remember mom or dad, don't you remember? Cause they don't. And trying to get them to be in your logical world is not going to work. Okay. So arguing with someone with dementia, I don't know anybody that has ever won, including me. I've had to learn that in my career because when I started in the nineties, I was in an Alzheimer's unit. That's what they called it. And they locked it up. And my administrator told me that I was not allowed to tour that area without her being there. And we did things very, very different, very different. So arguing is not good. It will help you and it will help your loved one. It will make for a better day. 
Um, and ignoring the symptoms won't make them go away. Also, too many medications can make people feel and act more confused. So I'm not a clinician. I am in the healthcare field. Um, but it is very, very important that if your loved one is on a lot of medications, please get with your physician and make sure, do they really need to be on all these medications? Because what we do in our communities is we try to eliminate as many medications as possible. Now, of course, cardiac medications, if someone has Parkinson's type medications, which is very, very time sensitive, we understand that those are extremely important. I'm not talking about those, but are there medications they've been on for years that maybe they don't need to be on anymore? Or maybe they've had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's for maybe 15 years. Do they really need to be on that Aricept or that Namenda anymore? Is it making any difference at all? So again, I'm not a, I'm not a physician. I'm not saying don't take them, take them, but just make sure that you are guiding your own healthcare with your physician. That's something too that I've learned. And especially since COVID has happened, um, we all have to be an advocate of our, of our loved one and ourselves, And we have to really ask a lot of questions. I will tell you, I'm not saying anything negative about physicians. There are wonderful physicians out there, but not every physician knows everything. So it's really good to make sure that you are, you have the right physician. You need a second opinion. There's nothing wrong with a second opinion or a third opinion. Because sometimes I've seen some of our residents have been on so many medications. They come to us. We kind of eliminate some of the meds and we actually see some improvement. Now, not an improvement that there's going to be a cure, but we start to see a little bit more um, clarity, um, which, which, is, which is much better for them. Or maybe it's limiting anxiety. So people living with dementia often experience a different reality than we do. So they may call out for their mother or insist that they have to go back to work, even though they've been retired for years. Reminder, you will, you will win an argument with, you won't win an argument with someone who has dementia. So mom, you know, your mom died 30 years ago. Don't you remember? No. We just try to quickly validate and switch gears. <laughs> so try to change the subject with something else. And I will tell you another suggestion is if you can compliment your loved one as much as possible, that will give them so much confidence and will help redirect them onto something else. Compliments, compliments, compliments. Whether that be they have a beautiful smile, what they're wearing today, they look beautiful, they look handsome, anything that you can do to provide that kindness and compassion. Compliments are very, very helpful for redirective tools. Okay. So again, I'm going to this. So I brought this up earlier. Sometimes it's us who needs to change. And it is. Um, I know that's difficult for some people to hear because, you know, we're the best person that can care for them. We're the closest thing to them that, you know, we know what's best for them. When oftentimes, sometimes we think we do, but we're not doing them any justice or ourselves. You definitely don't want to wake up every day and be like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have a horrible day with my spouse, trying to get them dressed, trying to you know, fight the fight of everyday tasks that are the life of someone that you're caring for with dementia. Kindness, compassion, compliments. Those are very, very good redirected tools. So oftentimes reigning in our own action for an appropriate response is key. It takes practice not to automatically scold or snatch something away rather than offering a more appealive alternative in a calm and friendly voice. I had a, a family member that moved his, it, it, this is a sad story, but it ended up being a wonderful story, but it was a young couple. They were in their early sixties. Husband brought his wife and she had early onset dementia. 
early onset Alzheimer's. Um, she had probably had it for about 10 years. He didn't really realize it had been that long, but it really had been. Well, she was trying to eat the ornaments off the Christmas tree. And he was grabbing them from her and taking them from her. And, and she wanted those ornaments. And, you know, we had to really work with him and say, you know what? We need to remove those items. She wants those things. So let's give her something more tangible that she can grab onto. And if she wants to put it in her mouth, she can. Um, there, are, there are toys out there. There are devices out there for, for folks with dementia and early onset that, that we can help, you know, give an alternative option for them. So again, we have to sometimes change our behavior. So rather than asking them, don't you remember? I hear that so many times and I'm like, oh, don't say that because they don't remember. And it's really hard because I say that to my kids all the time. I'm like, don't you remember? Sometimes I think my 24 year old son has dementia at times. It's just, <laughs> it's just, um, it's their listening skills. You know, they, they have critical, they, they have um, limited thinking skills. And they only want to hear what they want to hear. So don't say, do you remember? It's a very difficult habit to pull away from. Instead, utilize photo books are huge, an amazing tool. If you can do large photo books, if you can't do it, you know, do it online. If you're on a computer, however, what's easiest for you. I know Walgreens, um, you've got all sorts of, uh, Walgreens is a fantastic way you can do photo books. You put in the photos, email them to them, and you, voila, they come up with a photo book, which is amazing. Um, but a family photo book, pull that out and bring those memories to them. Their wedding photos, maybe their achievements in life, their career, um, certificates, things, things that, that were important to them that happened years ago that is probably most likely going to jog a memory. Because with dementia, it's their short-term memory that starts to go. Their long-term memory lasts the longest. That's the ones that's the last to go. And oftentimes, they still are there. They're there. So we must find the strengths and abilities of our loved ones and to minimize the physical, mental, and psychological challenges that they face daily. So sharing your struggles and receiving help is important. Like I was telling Jay earlier, I think the more that you can be around people that are caring for a loved one with dementia, to share your experiences and help one another, the better. Now, my dad comes from a generation. My dad is 85 years old. And that generation is extremely private. I understand that. But this type of holding in and not asking for help with your struggles is actually making it worse for you and your loved ones. You may find it, it's none of, but it's nobody's business. It's embarrassing. I don't want someone to know. There are so many people out there that are in your same situation. So you're, you're, you're declining education. So the more that you can connect with people that have this same situation, the better off you're going to be because you can share experiences together. I, I actually, my grandmother had dementia. She was 93. She never forgot who I was. She had um, vascular dementia. It was from strokes. And she also had falls from sub She had dementia from subdural hematomas. Um, she was stubborn as the Dickens. Um, she was, I bought her one of those, uh, the lifeline buttons. And she would not, we, we tried to suggest to get her out of the house. And of course, since she knew where I worked, she didn't wanted nothing to do with me to talk about my work because I'm not leaving my home. You're not pulling out of my home. So we did everything we could to give her the support in her home to help her maintain her independence, but safely. So she was independent with me going over, my dad going over, my aunt going over, meals being delivered. The housekeeper was there. She wouldn't wear that dang button. And she fell and she laid in a pool of blood for three hours. Thank God my aunt went over there. Otherwise, she would have died. And off to the hospital she was. 
Um, and we were able to get her into our assisted living. And she did have dementia, but we were able to, you know, make it work in the assisted living environment. She wasn't an elopement risk. She wasn't, she was physically um, declining. And so it, it worked out for her. And it was a place that I worked out in Kansas. So they just, they just spoiled her rotten, which was great. So, um, but I think that, you know, if you're not getting, letting people know that you're having these struggles, um, you don't have the resources. Okay. So millions of caregivers make every effort to do the task of caregiving well, and some end up doing it mostly alone, which is very scary and know that there's help out there. Caregivers often have no idea how exhausted they are. And if they do, they may, they may feel like their fatigue doesn't matter anyways, because they have a job to do. And especially with spouses, till death do us part, I'm going to do everything I can to take care of you if it kills me. And I will tell you, I've seen it happen where the caregiver gets completely burned out and they're the one that goes first. So it's very important to utilize your resources. Instead of barely hanging on day after day, caregivers seek out home health care services. You should be seeking out home health care services, adult daycare facilities such as Benavia. Respite care is huge and important, and many places offer respite care. So, and I could be preaching to the choir, but respite care, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's a short stay anywhere. It could be in a community. You could be getting respite care from a home care agency or a neighbor or a family friend that wants to come and help or adult daycare facilities such as Benavia or a community. Communities such as ours and many communities throughout the Valley and throughout the United States offer respite care. And what that means in a community setting is just care 30 days or less. So for example, Right now in our communities in Arizona, I have just in our Chandler property, I have seven residents there for respite care right now for two weeks. Because I think everyone since COVID, everyone's you know either picking back up their vacations. There's a lot of graduations where families want to go out of town. So those are nice services for you to be able to utilize so you can go do these things and your loved ones being cared for. So don't shy away from respite care. That is going to be one thing that is going to keep you not only healthy, sane, and keeping you out of the hospital. Okay, so respite care is huge. Um, let's see here. Oops. Okay. And also support, and we'll, we'll get to support groups down the road here. We'll, I'm going to get moving on. Okay. Also, having the difficult conversations about medical choices. So those statistics that I read earlier to you when I started, unfortunately, dementia doesn't get better, okay? It's, it's not going to improve. It is us as the caregivers that have to change our behaviors and find the resources so we can provide them the best dignity and respect in their life as they are going through this journey. But I... I often, I always like to talk about advanced directives because it still blows my mind with families coming to me that I sit down in front of that still don't have their advanced directives and they're in their nineties. Um, or they don't have, uh, you know, they don't have their medical power of attorney. They don't have their general power of attorney. And for those of you in Arizona, I'm sure you've heard this mental power of attorney is paramount in this journey. Because if your loved one gets diagnosed with dementia and they can't make decisions and you try to go to an attorney, you're not going to be able to get power of attorney because they already have the dementia diagnosis. And if they're through their journey to where they can't make those decisions, you now have to switch gears and you have to go to guardianship conservatorship, which costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of hoops to jump through in the system. So for those of you who do not have your advanced directives, your medical power of attorney, including your mental power of attorney, 
And I think a lot more states are starting to do the mental health care power of attorney. So for those of you that are, are not in Arizona, I would definitely research it. Um, that gives you the power to be able to make decisions with a seamless process, okay? It will help you and help your loved one be able to get the care that they need if the floor drops underneath you, okay? Um, so it's very hard to think about the uncertain future after a dementia diagnosis. I can only imagine. You may need some time to absorb and process the information. However, instead of avoiding the uncomfortable conversation about medical decisions and power of attorney documents, take time to discuss these important choices. Um, I had to do this with my father and my dad doesn't have dementia. He's just, he's getting very physically very physically disabled. Um, he's just, his body is just really breaking down. And I said, dad, you know, we, we need to review your, your healthcare power of attorney records, you know, at least every five years. Cause I said, if you get mad at me and you don't want me to be your, your agent, then we've got to get my brother on board. And he just laughs, but it's important to make sure that you are, if you have your documents, make sure that you're reviewing them at least every five years and, or on any significant change. OK, um, I have a lot of folks that come from Illinois or Wisconsin and, oh, well, I got these back in the 90s. Well, you know, things have changed. Laws have changed. You know, make sure you're reviewing those documents um, often, more frequent than, than not. OK, so have a talk with your loved one, especially the one that just gets diagnosed with dementia sooner rather than later. Why? Not having to guess about medical decisions and personal preferences can afford you with much more peace of mind knowing that you are honoring their choices. Remember, this is about them, okay? You're in it, you're a part of the equation, but that is also part of providing and providing them dignity throughout this journey is allowing them and honoring them their choices. Hey, do you want to take a second and see if there's any questions out there? Yes. Do Anybody have, have any questions? I know that's a lot of amazing information there. I love it. That's, uh, I always feel smarter at these events. Well, good. <laughs> that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. It's um, life stories. And, and Jay, do you have anybody in your life that has dementia, that your family? Um, I have selective dementia. Well, me too. Me too. <laughs> Me too. But, you know, just like everybody, I had the, you know, I followed my dad out here back in the early 90s. And it was the same thing. You you told the story exactly how it was in my life. It's amazing, you know. And uh, the only thing I can say is nowadays, folks like you, and there's a lot of different senior resources out there that are just phenomenal nowadays compared to what it was back in even the 90s. So. Oh yes. Yeah. It's, it's been, it's been a huge transformation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, oh, that's another part of why I like to really educate and communicate to as many people as possible that it's not your, it's not your nursing home anymore. Um, you know, people can live in assisted living and, or in a memory care community and never have to go to a nursing home. Yeah. Those are, you know, the, the, the wave of the nursing home, the nursing homes have really turned into skilled nursings and long-term care. Um, so, you know, really people can live out their life in assisted living. So, which is fantastic. And that is providing dignity in their life. So. Paige, I do have a question from Melissa. Yes. She asks, what are the differences you see with vascular dementia and Alzheimer's? Okay. So the differences between vascular and your Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's type dementia, you've got the plaques and tangles um, and, you know, your brain is actually shrinking. Whereas your vascular dementia is caused more from a stroke. So the cerebral vascular, a CVA accident, if people are having mild TIAs, which is a trans ischemic attack, which is a mini stroke. And then if there's a massive stroke, those are things that are going to cause vascular dementia. I will tell you the big differences. 
in behaviors. So my grandmother had vascular dementia because she was having strokes, many TIAs, and then she was falling and getting head trauma. Um, she always knew who I was and she always knew who her family members were. But I could be there for two weeks and would visit from uh, Arizona and I'd go to Kansas to see her and she'd say, where in the heck have you been? I haven't seen you in months. Well, I was just, I had been there all week. So it, 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 the memory parts, it's just different effects, different damages to the parts of the brain. Whereas Alzheimer's, you know, my, like I said, my grandmother vascular, she never forgot who I was. She always knew what a toilet was. She knew what a toothbrush was, but she didn't, she couldn't tell me, you know, maybe the date, she couldn't tell me, you know, the, the season, she, she, time was, you know, completely, um, it, she was completely confused with time and dates and things like that. And she would get turned around in sundown, but with Alzheimer's, you forget who your family is. You forget what a toilet is. You forget what a toothbrush is. And in worst case scenarios, you forget who you are. So, um, and that's, that's, and it doesn't happen with everybody, but, and I will tell you that if you've met, if you've met someone with dementia, or if you've met 2000 people with dementia, you've met one for the first time because every single one of them are different. They have a lot of similarities with their diagnoses, but they're all still pretty different because you have to keep in mind personality. You know, what was their upbringing? Have there been any traumatic events in their life? I had a lady that, that developed, it was early onset dementia, and they think it was caused from trauma from losing her husband. He was in a car wreck and was killed. And she was in her 60s. Now, did this just kick it in? Was she already probably going to get it? Most likely, yes. But because of this traumatic event, it exacerbated it and put it into, you know, to fifth gear. And so she ended up passing away at like 66 years old, which was really, really sad. So if, I hope that helps answer your question. Um, and, and if your loved one is diagnosed, a lot of neurologists will not diagnose Alzheimer's type dementia. They're starting to get better. Um, and with the scans and MRIs and, and all that stuff, they're able to really see the plaques and tangles and the shrinkage of the brain um, to be able to diagnose it. But some still just call it dementia. And, and, and that's why, you know, if you can try to get a firm type of dementia from the neurologist, or the physician that you're seeing, hopefully it's a neurologist, um, you know, that will help you be able to, to help kind of guide what to look for. Um, my girlfriend's dad just passed away of, of um, Parkinson's dementia. And he had, he's had, he had Parkinson's for 15 years. And I'm, I met him for the first time five years ago and I saw his dementia. And I told her, I said, my girlfriend's name is Jordan. I said, Jordan, your, your dad's had dementia for quite a while. I just, you know, I, you guys were getting all the services you could and, and you were doing everything, you know, you you had, he was in a safe place and everything was going well, but he, he, he had quite a bit of dementia going on that they didn't realize. But as I was able to help kind of coach her and guide her um, and get her some of the resources for the family, that was very helpful. So if you can find out what type of dementia, if a doctor will give it to you, that's very helpful. So I, that was a long answer. So I hope that helped. <laughs> Hey, Paige, I, I, I come from the old school where um, people are presenting always say, even if you know the answer to a question, ask it because a lot of other folks won't know what it is. So during, That's during, right. your, during your explanation, or you mentioned a term called sundowning. Yes. Can you explain that? Okay. So sundowning, I call it to make it um, kind of a reader's digest, is your loved one that has dementia I call it like, depending on what their daily routine is like, let's say they get up at seven o'clock or maybe you're an early riser. Are they up with you? Are they up at night? And then through the course of the day, you know, are they taking naps? Are they not taking naps? They, they start to run out of their battery. Okay. So if you're having your loved one up 
as early as you are, maybe you're an early riser and you're out taking them with your errands and they're going with you to all these places and they're not getting naps, I will tell you your sundowning is going to get worse. So the sundowning, what happens is, is they get extremely more confused and it can start in the early afternoon, one o'clock, two o'clock. It could start after dinner time where they just get, it, it's like the dementia and the forgetfulness and confusion is exasper, it, it's exasperated. It's, it's in full motion and it's the worst it's ever been. That is called sundowning. So I would suggest if you are caring for a loved one, please try to get them to nap if you can, if that is in your schedule. You know, routine is huge. Um, what we do with our residents in their journey, when we have residents that are starting to really, our, our portion that really have difficulty in sundowning, where it's, they'll come up to the resident nurse's desk and say, I, I need to go home. I've got to get my car. Or I'm looking for the train. Somebody's here to pick me up or I've got to get to school. You know, we have to look at, okay, have they been up all day? Have we kept them so completely entertained with activities all day that we needed to actually let them rest? So we find it better and it, it improves their quality of life and it helps with the sundowning if you can get them to nap. Doesn't have to be long, doesn't have to be a full long lay down two hour nap, but I mean, if they can just rest, you know, listen to soothing music, um, relaxing music in their recliner and let them take a rest and, and, and have that rest. It will help eliminate with that sundowning. Sundowning is not fun. So I, I can imagine some of you are, are dealing with that because it happens a lot. Napping will help any way you can get it. Even if you need to take them on a car ride and they, they take a snoozer in the car, <laughs> that will help too. Okay, so I want to play a video of our senior gerontologist with our company. And this kind of talks about how Kelsch communities, how what we do provides dignity in our communities. And these are all of our communities, not just memory care, but it's independent living, assisted living, and memory care. But this one's really focused on, on memory care. So I'm going to click this, and I just want to make sure, I hope you can hear it, because I we didn't test this, Jay. Can you hear? I'm Benjamin, social gerontologist at Kelsey. The reason I make it It's a little, little choppy. Is it? Can you raise the volume on your laptop? Because it's gone away now. Oh. Unfortunately, we're at the, we're at the, uh, the hands of the Zoom gods, if they have, depending on how much bandwidth they give us, whether or not the videos play well. Yep, I'm getting comments, Is no it, volume. No volume? Okay, no volume. hold on one second. I should, let me see here. Um, let me go to this, share sound. Okay, let's try this. I'm a social gerontologist with Kelsch Communities. The reason I became a social gerontologist was because I saw the greatest generation wasting away playing bingo. Oh, sorry. It's probably Zoom. It is. There we go. Here, I'll pull. There we go. Part of an international movement to change that. I want to make sure our elders have an opportunity to live lives of meaning and purpose where they can serve and where their stories are honored. We focus on reconnecting people to things that matter to them. We talk about our Living Well program as seven ways that we reconnect people to the things that matter most to them. Living well in nature, living well in art, living well in spirit, living well in mind and body, living well with friends and family, living well in community, living well in music. 
music is a huge, often underestimated relationship that we humans have. For many of us, music starts our day, music ends our day, music motivates us to work, music motivates us to exercise, music motivates us to worship. We humans relate to music in a very personal and also very communal way. Throughout all of our communities, we capture the stories of the ladies and gentlemen who live within our communities. And we capture the stories visually and with words. In our memory care communities, we capture them with resident shadow boxes. These shadow boxes capture the life story, capture the photographs of the person's family or career or hobbies or passions. Our team members are constantly coming up with new ways to engage residents who are just not buying maybe the traditional programs. We had a resident living with us who spent his career working on Mount Hood. He would climb up Mount Hood in the snow every day to turn on the ski lifts. 70 years later, we find out that he's always dreamed of riding up Mount Hood on the ski cap. Our team was able to put together a whole day for him to go up Mount Hood on the ski cat, eat in the lodge, drink in the lodge with his wife, and he remembered it for weeks even though he had dementia. So that's one way we create opportunities for our elders across the country is by a specific resident that needed something, a creative team member met that need, and it's like sparks ignited a whole new program that we would have never dreamed of before. We have one of the most extensive travel programs for people with various ability levels anywhere in the United States. But we find a way to make it possible for people to go to the places they like to go. The reason we create choice, the reason we create multiple opportunities throughout the day for our ladies and gentlemen to engage in life is because everybody is so different. Every human being has a need to reconnect with purpose. We need a reason to get up in the morning. We need a reason to live. We can provide the best care. We can provide the greatest food. We can provide the best buildings. But if someone doesn't have a reason to live, why get up in the morning? Why enjoy that food? So a lot of families talk to me and their question is, when should I move mom or dad? I need, I need to wait, I need to wait till the very last minute to move mom or dad because she, she wants to be at home, she loves being at home. But what we see over and over again is people living at home are isolated, scared, frightened, and they have nothing to do. They move into our communities and they, they carry that with them. But because we've been so intentional about our active living programming, we see people come out of their shells. We see people build new relationships. We see people explore the world in ways that they hadn't for five, 10 years. And all of a sudden, they're a new person. They've got a job to do. They're playing the piano for the rest of the residents. They're leading the beanbag baseball team. They're a part of the community and they have a whole new lease on life because they found their purpose when they have new experiences, new friends and purpose, the world changes for somebody. So those were our communities in Washington. That's one of our newest properties. And those were our residents in three of our buildings in Washington. So, um, Benjamin, like I said, our senior gerontologist for our com for our company, um, has really done a phenomenal job of bringing technology, um, new programs. Um, when we move a resident in to our communities, and and this is for anybody, if 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 you have if you've got home care coming into your home, if you are doing a, a day daycare stay uh, with Benavia, which I'm sure Jay, you probably do this too. It's so important for the one that's caring for your loved one, if it's not you, for temporary or long term, they know they have a history of who your loved one is. So we have a very, very extensive, intense, intense social biography um, that needs to be completed that we go over with the family. It's about eight pages, um, really telling us who they are and their life story. So we can 
be able to provide the dignity to them in the communities, pair them up with like residents. Um, so they do have the best quality of life. So it, it's been, it's been extremely successful. We've been doing it since I've been with them. It just keeps getting better and better. And we get more programs. Um, one of the programs we use is Immerse Listening by Eversound. I have it in the program here. You can get onto their website. Uh, Eversound is a, is, a, is a remarkable device. It's a hearing device. A lot of times people don't understand, you know, is it dementia or can they not hear? So if your resident has really poor hearing, make sure they can hear okay. So these are these headphones, this Eversound. We use these in our communities with all of our residents. We have like 30 of them in each community and we use them in our, in our memory care communities are only like 60 residents. So we use them um, throughout the day, every day, all day. Um, for residents, we have a, they each have their own song playlist. So every resident has a customized playlist of music that they like. So it's for music. Music is a huge redirective tool. Um, again, if there's sundowning going on, put on mom or dad or your spouse's favorite music. Um, see how much it might switch gears to help redirect that behavior. But the, the Eversound has been extremely successful for us, um, helping their quality of life and their dignity to also help with families. You know, if they have the hard of hearing, and we have family members that come in, we'll put this headset on and the, the resident family member will speak into the, to the microphone. Our active living directors utilize these. So when they're in an activity, they can hear okay and hear clearly. Um, our nursing staff will carry those and, and say, you know what, Mrs. Smith, I, I need to give you your medication today and letting them know what is happening so they can hear it. Because oftentimes they have hearing loss along with their dementia. So that, that too can, can really help. I think, I think we often think we, we forget about the hearing part of it. So Eversound has been a huge success in our communities. Um, and you can check out the website and check it out on your own. Um, another thing that's been pretty successful, which we started this right when, right before COVID happened. And thank goodness, this has been a huge tool for us in our communities. And I don't, I'm sure there's other properties and other places that do utilize it. Um, but we, like I said, we started this in about, I think 2019 or right, right before COVID started. It's called Familio. And it's a family to resident newsletter. So keeping connected with your family and your friends is going to provide dignity to your residents. Um, just because maybe they can't get out, we want to make sure that they are getting the information to them, their loved ones who love them. Um, so I want to, I just want to play a quick tutorial on Familio. A lot of our families, most of our families participate in this. Um, it is a fee. We charge them. I think it's like, I think it's a hundred dollars a year, but it is such a wonderful tool for their loved one. And, um, it, it really connects them back to their family. So I'll give you a little tutorial on this. Matthew lives in San Francisco. He has three brothers and many cousins who live all over the world. His grandmother, Nancy, lives in a retirement community in Key West, Florida. She lives happily there with many friends. However, she really misses her family. Nancy doesn't use social media. Her grandchildren no longer send her the letters and postcards she loves to read. Fortunately, Nancy's retirement community has just subscribed to Familio. Familio is a new idea that makes it possible for Matthew and his family to stay in touch with their grandmother Nancy in a really simple way. Matthew posts his messages quickly and easily through the Familio mobile app. For its part, Familio puts together all the family members' messages. Then, all the contents are reorganized to become a personalized gazette, which is printed and handed out by the retirement community to Nancy. Nancy is grateful. She can now follow the family's news in a medium that is comfortable to her, paper. 
Matthew is delighted. As well as being able to easily write messages to his grandmother, he can also share them with all of his family and in turn, stay tuned to the latest news his cousins are posting. Nancy's retirement community can post regular news on a dedicated feed through Familio. It gives Matthew and his family the opportunity to better know Nancy's daily routine at the nursing home. With Familio, enjoy a simple and innovative solution to keep in touch with your loved ones daily. So for those of you, like I said, that haven't heard of Familio, it has been um, a huge success. And also, it was huge for our assisted living communities. So if you can imagine, when COVID happened, um, you know, everybody went into lockdown. So how are our loved ones going to be able to connect with their loved ones from out of town or even just, you know, a mile away because they couldn't be seen um, except through a window or FaceTime. So this, this was actually very, very helpful um, for our mental health of all of our residents. So um, I, again, you there's a website on here. If you you know, ever want to want to research it, it, it was, it's, it's been very, very helpful. So a lot of our residents get a weekly newsletter delivered to them every week. So they have a newsletter that's personalized to them and they get excited about it. And that's an, an independent living all the way to memory care. Okay. Does anybody have any questions right now? All we, right. We, yes. We do have a question in the chat box. Okay. Let me scroll up here from Susie Walling. That's okay. me. <laughs> That's Susie. Hi, there. Susie. How are you? Okay. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Wonderful. Terrific. Susie says your sibling has dementia slash Alzheimer's and has become more debilitated over many years. How might that affect you genetically? Wow, powerful. Yeah, well, Susie, um, it, it absolutely can affect you genetically. Um, I would definitely do a little bit more research about your family to see if there are other family members. And if it is the Alzheimer's type diagnosis, you know, dementia is this huge umbrella, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard. It's dementia is, there's so many. I mean, there's over a hundred different types of dementia mm -hmm. and growing. But Alzheimer's is the largest form of dementia, and it is pretty strong when it comes to family history. In my experience, I've had people that have sk it skipped a generation. Their aunt had it. They didn't end up getting it, or their mom got it. They didn't end up getting it. But I've also had some where I had a, I had a lady, and she's passed on, and I'll never forget. Her name is Bernice, and she had eight siblings and they all got it. So um, does it play a part in your genetics? I believe absolutely it does. Um, now how that manifests over time and which generation it might skip, that's the mystery. There are tests out there. There is a genetic test that you can take, but I would be very, very cautious and make you really research if you're going to take that test, because I will tell you, if you have, it could affect your life insurance mm -hmm. if you become positive. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it, it could, you know, do you want to know? Sometimes it's the fear of knowing and the fear of the unknown. Um, so it's one of those, it, it's a very personal question you have to ask yourself, but I would mm -hmm. probably do a little bit more research with your family to see, are there other family members that have had it? Do you have a large family? Um, I have to get off mute. You're, you're off mute. You're okay. Oh, oh, am I off? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Um, okay. Well, I had a number of aunts and uncles and um, cousins. Um, I'm not Thinking, I'm thinking my my grandmother maybe had like a geriatric dementia towards the end, um, okay. and my mother also had back 
kind of thing happening. Um, but my brother was very vibrant. He's only five years older than me, so he's in his early 80s. And um, he's had it for several years and has come to the point where he doesn't recognize family. And I don't even think he speaks at this point in time. And he's in, he's in the, he, my sister-in-law put him into a community. Okay, and he's and he's only five years older than you. He is only five years older. Than you. Okay, but I am not familiar that anyone on either side had dementia. Doesn't mean did they did, they didn't. My cousin had a I guess a, a form of dementia, but but she also had Parkinson's. So yes, a, so that kind of combination. Um, so yeah. So, I mean, you go back and forth, is it genetic or not? And I've heard both sides, but it sounds like you're on the side of that it is genetic. It, it, it's, it, I, I, in my circumstances of what I've seen, it has been genetic, but like I said, it's skipped different family members. Mm -hmm. So it's, right. it's kind of one of those, you know, uh, depending on how strong it is. Uh, I do know that the one that I've seen in my, my experiences is the early onset has been really one of the, the, the most traumatic ones yeah. It comes on really hard and it goes really fast, but they get it really young, um, mm -hmm. which is really, really sad. I would think, you know, just from what you're saying, I think you might be okay because your brother's had it for many, many years and he's only five years older than you and you seem to be very healthy. I'm assuming um, you're yeah, alone. I, I, can, I can juggle a lot of balls in the air and stuff like that. <laughs> yes. Good. Good. Well, that's a good thing. I would, I would be, you know, um, you just, you my, you know, everybody needs to manage their stress in their life. I mm -hmm. mean, stress is always going to be there no matter what form sure. it comes in or what's going on. Um, you know, do things that make you happy. And, and um, I think, I think you're going to be fine. I think you're going to be fine. So again, you know, I, talk to your doctor about it maybe, mm -hmm. but if you do decide yeah, to do the test, um, you know, I have, a, yeah. I have a friend that is a very good friend of mine and I'm 47. We're the exact same age. Her mother has Alzheimer's and she's in her, she's only in her sixties. I think she's only 20 years older than her. So oh. she's seven. Her aunt had Alzheimer's. Um, her uncle had Alzheimer's and her grandmother and great grandmother had Alzheimer's. So she is just absolutely terrified. Um, yeah. And, you know, and I've kind of talked through her with it. And I said, well, you know, you have to make that decision if you want to do the gene test. Because like I said, they've got all this genetic testing out there. Yes. But it's like, you know, do you want to know? Do you not want to know? Because then if you know you have it, then everything that you do that you forget, you're going to be like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. I, I forget. I, and I will tell you, forgetting things doesn't mean you have dementia. Yeah. So. Please understand that everyone. I walk out and I have to really mindfully think about when I go shopping, especially at Christmas, that's the worst. You have to find out where did you park? <laughs> Focus on where you parked so you know, you know, so you can so you can remember exactly where you park because we're all so busy. You know, we live in a very busy world and we live with so many things coming at us with technology and social media. And just, we live in a very fast world. So slow down, be mindful of what you're doing, mindful of your stress and forgetting things is normal. Okay. If you lost your keys and you can't find them, that's normal. Normal as can be. It happens to me all the time. My husband says, honey, have you ever thought about putting the same thing in the same spot every day? And I said, you know what? You're so smart. You are so smart. <laughs> so logical. So things like that, you know, because when we're running around and doing things, we tend to lose things. But if you lose your keys or you forget where you're parked, it's not a big deal. But if you find your keys in the freezer or, you know, the bathtub or things like that, eh, that's a little different. Finding things in different places or missing, misplacing things in odd places, you know, that, that's a little concerning. But it's OK to have forgetfulness because we all have it at any age. Trust me, I have it. <laughs> Jay, I bet you would you would concur as well. <laughs> we live in a very immersive society. And, yes. And we have no many times we don't have control over it. So you are absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. That's right. 
Yeah. And it's, and, and I work with so many people that are, you know, very high executives and professionals and there's like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot about that. Or can you remind me of this? I mean, so those are, it's just, we live in a very fast paced world. And I think, I think us as human beings, and especially for those of you that are caregivers, you're taking on so much. So that's going to eliminate you not getting enough sleep. Maybe you're not eating right. You're not taking good care of yourself. So that's also going to cause, you know, some confusion. And I will tell you if anybody's had a UTI, a urinary tract infection, that can cause a lot of confusion and misconception. I've seen people be diagnosed with dementia when they shouldn't have been diagnosed. So it's very important for if you see something or you see some forgetfulness going on in yourself or your loved one that happens to be, you know, kind of on a fast pace or you see a change quickly, get to the doctor, get your blood work done. You know, are you drinking enough water? Uh, For those of us in Arizona, we all know by this time we have to hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. And for us women out there that always have to go to the bathroom, (laughs) we hate drinking because we always got to go to the bathroom all the time. But those are important things because dehydration, urinary tract infections, and malnourishment can show signs of dementia when it's not. So I hope that answers your question a little bit or gives you some food for thought. Okay. Thank you, Susie. Um, Oh, whoops. Okay. So kind of going back to um, my dad's motto. I love it. I use it all the time. It's always better to be kind than to be right. Kind, compassionate, compliments, caring. Um, The more love you can give to your, your loved one and just be overly nice and complimentary, it helps with redirective tools, Um, helps provide them dignity. You know, I oftentimes think about what would it feel like to be someone with dementia? You know, I would want someone to just love me and smile with me, be kind to me and help me with the struggles that I do have. And I'll try to be kind, you know, as kind as I can back. But I think that you're going to get a better outcome and, and some redirective tools. And it provides dignity to your loved one. Um, so being intentional in how you choose your words and your actions can go a long way towards truly treating those you care for with dignity and respect. Your approach is everything. And I, I, I utilize the approach with everything in my everyday life. You know, I have people that, um, I've worked with in the past that, you know, not, not here, you know, just there's, there's always going to be somebody that doesn't like us or that maybe we don't get along with, or maybe their approach is wrong. But I, I think that, you know, if, if we choose to do things with kindness and compassion and our body language and our approach is everything that you're going to get a better outcome. Okay. So how will you start to change your approach with your loved one? So dementia cards do you have them? And if anybody doesn't know what dementia cards are, and I don't, I've ordered more for me. I have little business cards that say, my loved one has dementia. Please be patient. And then I also have cards that say, my loved one has memory loss. Because some people don't know what dementia is. Not everybody knows. So I would encourage you, if you need cards, I have them. I can give them to Jay or I can email you one. You could get them printed out. That will help you with your loved one when you are out in public. So let's say you're going out to dinner and you have your husband with you and your husband is, you know, starting to struggle with his journey and he's starting to get more and more forgetful. It's a nice little card you can hand to the server and let them know my loved one has memory loss. Please be patient. So then they understand, okay, and they're not going to be put in a uncomfortable or an embarrassing situation out in public. And like I was saying to Jay, in Arizona, we are becoming more and more city-friendly dementia, which is phenomenal for the dementia movement. So businesses, recreational parks, Um, restaurants, you know, the whole community understands that people are living with dementia and more and more of us are. So 
the more awareness we can teach the public, the better. So if you don't have dementia cards, I would suggest, and even you could go on, make one and order some cards online. You can order them at Vista Print, 500 cards, easy peasy. Take them with you. And I would just say, my loved one has memory loss. Please be patient. Thank you. And that will help you with any sort of struggles you might be having out in the public. If you want to go do fun things, the movies, go to a play, you still need to live your life and your loved one still wants to live their life too. And that is providing dignity and respect. Okay. Let's see here. So quality of life, let's see here, is not impossible with dementia. Coping with the diagnosis of dementia is often not easy. There are losses to grieve, changes to make, and many things to learn. However, you don't have, you don't need to fall for the lie that will always be terrible with dementia. It's just not true. Instead, listen to others who have been there. Again, that networking supportive network, sharing with people that you know that have been through this or are in this. The more you can share, the more you are caring for your loved one and for yourself. So listen to others who have been there, done there, walked the walk, who acknowledges the challenges and don't deny the pain, but who also strive to continue to enjoy life. I, I, I work a, a memory cafe in Sun Lakes and I help facilitate a, a memory cafe support group there. And, and um, it, it's just amazing how all, most of them are spouses that I work with in this group, particular group. And it's amazing how they have grown to learn about this challenging journey. And we've even utilized them in some of our presentations. I mean, they're the ones that are walking this journey and they're learning so much and they're, help, they're helping others and they're, they are finding their purpose in life. Um, so, and I even have a lady that has dementia and she has spoken at some of our, our presentations and, and she's been phenomenal. So. The more you can, the more you can get information and share, the better. So, and according to many people who are living with dementia, there are ways to still enjoy life and have a high quality of life, which we just talked about, despite your challenges. Take hope from their words when they say that they still enjoy socialization with friends, good food, pet therapy, and laughter always can be the best redirection is laughter and kindness. So I have some dementia care resources here. I refer off, I refer quite a few people to the Banner Alzheimer's Institute. Um, you guys have your, your Banner Sun Health right there in, in Sunlight or in, uh, I'm sorry, in Surprise in the West Valley. Uh, but for those in, in Arizona, the Banner Alzheimer's Institute is, is a phenomenal resource. Um, if, especially if you don't know where to start. Banner is a great place. Alzheimer's Association nationally. Um, the Alzheimer's Association has really stepped up the plate in the last five years. And um, they have a phenomenal amount of resources. Uh, Barrow Neurological Institute here in Arizona is phenomenal, um, especially for those that have Parkinson's type dementia. They're, they're wonderful. Of course, Benavia. Fantastic resource. Jay, thank you for all you guys do. And um, another one that I utilize a lot is if you don't know who Tipa Snow is, and probably some of you do, but if you do not, the positive approach to care with Tipa Snow and her team, link here, you can link on and see her YouTube videos. I actually do have a video, but I don't think we're going to have time for it, but I kept it just in case if I spoke too quick. Um, but I would highly recommend that you get on to Tipa Snow's positive approach to care and just watch her tidbit um, YouTube videos. She's a dementia care expert. She will help you with redirective tools if you're struggling with behaviors, sundowning, but also provides dignity and respect through this journey. She's phenomenal. And we utilize her in all of our, our trainings. Um, we hire her for. Um, Quite a bit of stuff. We actually had a, um, 
a podcast uh, this morning talking to first responders and how they deal with dementia in the community in a different state. But I think Arizona is doing a pretty good job. I think we can always do better. Um, but as we get turnover, we can continue to educate. But um, TIPA Snow is a phenomenal resource. Um, a local Arizona resource and a friend of mine, her name is Pam Ostrowski. Jay, I don't know if you've heard of Pam. Maybe you have. Okay, good, good, good. I'm glad. She's doing her, her due diligence and getting her book out there. Yep. For those of you that need a good guidebook, um, Pam actually had her mother in our community in Surprise at Rock Creek Memory Care from 2013 to 2016. She took care of her mom for 12 years and she said, you know, everything I thought I knew about it and everything that I did was wrong. And so her journey, she talks about in the early stages and how she learned through the journey of what to do and what not to do. So when her mom passed away in 2016, she decided to educate herself and she wrote a book. So she has this guidebook. It's called, it's not that simple. She's now a dementia educator and it's a large print book. It is a three hour easy to read. I would highly suggest it. You can get on Amazon, get onto her website and it's a great read. So it will help give you some tips um, and things that, uh, that will help you. Just to add to that page, yes. she's been a presenter at our Benavia Caregiver Connect events. Perfect. And so if you go back onto our YouTube channel again for our Caregiver Connect, uh, you'll see a, a 30 to 45 minute presentation by her. It was just awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Pam is, is phenomenal. Her and I work closely together. Um, I met her uh, a year and a half ago and I didn't realize she was at Rock Creek. You know, I mean... She had this, she was, you know, doing, you know, coming, getting her book out there. And um, we've just kicked it off, adore her. Um, I, I utilize her in our communities. We do a, she does a dementia Q&A in our communities where we invite people and families in our community, um, in, in, in the, the communities, I should, in the community and our communities. I hate the word facility. That's not a good word. We'd say community. Um, no, and it's just a Q&A. No no, right, right. No F word, right? Um, and it's just, it's a Q and a, it's just a interactive, you know, kind of like this, people can ask questions and, and she's, she's very educated on that and she's walked the walk, you know, she, she's done it. So it's, uh, I would definitely, if you don't know her, check her out. And then every first and third Wednesday of each month via zoom, you can be on a caregiving support group. It's dementia friendly with me. But I also share it with Elaine, and I, I apologize, Elaine, if you see this video, I forgot to put you on here, but Elaine poker Yant, which is with Successful Aging, she is a dementia expert as well, and she works with Visiting Angels in the uh, Arizona East Valley market. Her and I tag team together and do a support group online every first and third Wednesday. So there's a link here. You're welcome to join in. Um, anytime. And like Jay said, hey, with the virtual world, um, doesn't matter how many miles away we are. So welcome to join there. And again, I just want to remind everybody, caregiver burnout is so, it, it, it's help is out there. Please don't be shy to ask for help. Um, you know, I, I think that we've been in a society where for so long that you know, we're, we're trying to preserve our dignity and we're very private. Um, but I think, you know, the more that we reach out and find resources, the better off you and your, your loved one will be, the care partner and the care receiver will be. Um, I worked with a, a lady that jumped onto our support group today and she's a daughter and she just said, you know, I can't thank you enough for helping me get through this because I didn't know where to go, what to do, how to do it. And there's a lot of emotions involved. So finding the right support group for you is, is key. And we would hope that you would come and join us. We'd love that. Um, respite care. I highly encourage you to inquire, um, get your plan B in place, you know, make sure you're, you're, you know, if you are diagnosed with dementia or you are caregiving for someone um, or you're just getting information, get if there is a diagnosis of dementia in, with you or your family or spouse, please get a plan B in place. I can't tell you how many times people come to me and they're scrambling, trying to figure out, 
what's going to be the best situation for their loved one. Um, and they're rushed to make a decision. It's go time. It, it, you know, when they come to my door for uh, memory care options, it's not, it's not today. It was, I need it yesterday. So just have that backup plan. You may never need it. It's kind of, think of it as kind of insurance. It's just a little homework to do. Um, ongoing care plan meetings with your leadership team for, so for those of you that do have a loved one in a community, um, or in you know, a group home setting or daycare setting or anything like that, or even home care, make sure you are asking to go through the ongoing care plan meeting with the leadership or the person in charge of that organization. Because as you're changing and educating yourself as a care, care partner, caregiver, you, your loved one is changing. So that, what does that care plan look like? Does it need to change? You know, it's this disease. You're always having to juggle things. You've got to go with the flow. It's very fluid. So making sure that you are, are reaching out to the leadership team, if you have that in your, um, in your situation. So we have seven communities in Arizona. Um, we are, and since we have people here from maybe Colorado, Florida, and other places, we have, we have eight different states. We're in Arizona, California, Colorado. You can get on our website, but we're on eight states, but we do have seven in Arizona. We have our Chandler properties here. We have a memory care and an independent. Um, we also have uh, our Mesa property, which is memory care, and we have a memory care in Scottsdale. And then we have a whole campus in Surprise. So for those of you in the Surprise area, maybe you've heard of the park at Surprise, which has Rock Creek memory care and Solana. So those are our, um, our Arizona properties. Now I just want to open it. We, I, we, we got down to the end. I didn't talk too fast. Had enough content. Hopefully we were able to, is there any questions for anybody?